I'm starting this uh, talk about headwaters with a view, with a photo uh, taken by my aunt, actually, in um, Mission. Uh, my aunt and uncle live in the house that my grandfather first bought in the uh, late 30s in Calgary. That was the first property they owned in Calgary. Um, they, their house in Rideau was uh, pretty badly flooded, as were all their neighbors. Um, this photo is of Fourth Street, looking north, and um, it's it's about a few steps away from where my mother lives too. And uh, she's in a condo building where the basement was flooded, um, so she lost uh, most of what was in her storage. Um, her apartment was okay. She came to live with us for about 11 days um, while the power and all the other things were being fixed. So. I just wanted you to know that I was really, um, I experienced the pain of the people in the neighborhoods that were flooded. And um, I also, of course, am well aware through working for AWA that um, there are um, people who were devastated and are looking for uh, solutions that they hope will ever prevent them from going through that again. And they're looking for them up in our headwaters area. And that's something that our organization um, wants to make sure Albertans know the value of, um, that we treasure it, that we look after it for future generations because it is so special. So I'm going to talk, um, I, this is a vast topic that I've picked and really it, I will just choose a few stories to tell about it and, and raise questions and concerns. So I'm going to talk a bit about the infrastructure, in, the human infrastructure in the alluvial fans in, in our mountain areas. I'm going to talk about one of the dry dam locations that I've looked into a bit more than others, the, the proposed dry dam. And then I'm going to talk about a massive topic interrelated um, in industry linear features, motorized recreation, and then a few uh, recommendations at the end, just with some examples. So first, my organization, Alberta Wilderness Association, has been around since the mid-1960s, and one of our main um, goals is to, as I say, raise Albertans' awareness about the value of our wild spaces in, for their intrinsic uh, value as well as for what they do for us and protect large representative wilderness areas. So AWA's work in the sheep uh, elbow areas uh, and, in, and in some areas uh, north of Highway 1 really help pave the way for some of the provincial protected areas there that are very treasured by people all through the Bow Valley and, and indeed ar around the world, um, including C the Kananaskis country. Um, of course, many other people contributed to that as well. Uh, one of our other main mandates is to uh, look at and make recommendations for how we can improve land uses outside formally protected areas for healthy watershed function, for the water quantity and quality we rely on, as well as its importance to wildlife. So uh, this view, uh, courtesy of the Elbow River Watershed Partnership, of a part of the Upper Elbow that is uh, currently quite wild uh, with a healthy meandering river, uh, a mobile uh, river channel, um, showing um, native vegetation, uh, just illustrating the importance of unroaded areas of wetlands and, and grasses to absorb and slowly release water. So I was... Um, kind of intrigued yesterday talking to John Pomeroy at the uh, break um, about um, uh, research that I want to look further into where one of his colleagues at University of Saskatchewan looked at the role of beaver dams um, as dams, as natural storage, and as generators of wetlands during the 2013 flood. And that, of course, they didn't make the difference, but they're part of the resiliency of the landscape, our, our wetlands, um, in terms of holding back some uh, peak flows. And um, there's, uh, yeah, I think uh, another uh, relevant study just to, just to bring to your attention is that Ducks Unlimited commissioned John Pomeroy's group to do a study of the Vermilion watershed. Now that's a prairie watershed downstream, but it did find that study that the farther up in the headwaters you went, there was a relationship between uh, healthy um, res or restored wetlands and decline in peak flows. So I think more studies need to be done about that role of natural infrastructure and I certainly hope that the, fed uh, that the provincial um, piece of work that's been commissioned on natural infrastructure will help us understand that important role. In terms of alluvial fans, I just picked an example which is um, 
in the Can in Kananaskis country. Um, it's looking at Evan Thomas Creek. Uh, that's the area circled by red. Um, and how it was re-engineered or rerouted, really, to flow around the Kananaskis River, uh, Kananaskis Golf Course. So it, I was um, intrigued by this because we got a few calls after the flood to comment on flooding of the golf course and, and what should happen. And um, I spoke to a scientist uh, in Fish and Wildlife. She wasn't. She didn't personally uh, have, have the decades-long experience, but she pulled out some maps and said, yep, sure enough, um, what she could see and what her colleagues have told her, she just reconfirmed that, is that Evan Thomas Creek used to meander northwest after the road crossing, and it's, it's, a, light map, it's a light line on this map, but instead it was rerouted to flow straight west into the Kananaskis River. So um, it seems as though, obviously, and, and uh, we're, we're all, we all feel this way, we want to engage with rivers by locating close to them or recreating close with them. We just, I think, um, are, are sometimes guilty of having an idealized picture of what that means uh, over the decades. And when rivers actually engage with us to the full extent of their natural variation, then we're very threatened and we're very angry with them and we want to kind of restrict them and, and actually, in a way, go to, go to war with them to some extent. So I think those were the feelings of, of the folks um, in, in many areas, but here's a picture of the um, Kananaskis Golf Course and how the <clears throat> Evan Thomas Creek really uh, rerouted itself uh, in the direction that it used to flow. So what, uh, you know, golfers and the other people who enjoyed that area might have thought as the original route really was an artificial route. And I, I think one of the principles we need to ask ourselves is, um, especially for the flashiest of our mountain streams, um, we really should think about relocating and certainly preventing as much new construction in, in those highly um, uh, mobile and flashy alluvial fans uh, as we can. Next, uh, talking a little bit downstream about the importance of the flood pulse, and those of you who are here to listen to Amanda Hallowell would have heard her expand on this more. She pointed me actually in the direction of this paper that's, that I'll just read it to you, the principal driving force responsible for the existence, productivity, and interactions of the major biota in river floodplain systems is the flood pulse. Um, this is a nice photo of, of a healthy riparian system and some of the volunteers associated with the F Friends of Fish Creek Park doing their water quality monitoring. We have proposals, uh, and, and I'm zeroing in on one, um, in the upper uh, reaches of the Bow watershed for dry dams that I think would really fundamentally um, damage some of that, and we should think very, very carefully about it. So the one I've chosen, partly because um, initially it was illustrated, and then because I thought it was gaining a lot of traction, and then because more recently I found out some very interesting and concerning things about it, is the so-called EQ1 uh, dry dam berm, uh, proposed at the confluence of the Upper Elbow and Quirk Creek. And um, this is an idea that was um, shortlisted by the uh, Community Flood Mitigation Advisory Panel, authored by uh, Alan Markin, uh, Dino Damano, and Richard Linseth. And um, unfortunately, all I've been able to gather is their online slides. So um, they have uh, bullet points and tables. It doesn't really um, facilitate informed discussion, but I, I really wanted to comment on this from a number of angles. So an idealized author version uh, is this, with, without the berm. Um, and then I start uh, finding out some things about from previous studies um, that had been, that had been um, identified about this site. So uh, the illustration shows um, a berm. It doesn't seem to scale uh, based on the dimensions that were suggested. Oh, and I think I forgot to mention, yeah, the cost and the dimensions, 51 meters by 405 meters, um, and uh, a cost of about 80 to 100 million. So uh, then I find out, and I must give credit to a WaterSmart report of January 2014 that pointed me to these previous studies, that in two previous studies, this same site, when it was looked at for a more year-round water supply site, was not recommended. And one of the reasons was for seepage issues, because it's, it would be located where there's thick, pervious rock, side, rock slide debris uh, in the dam foundation. 
Um, the foundation conditions would include non-uniform rock slide debris with voids that are likely to deform under embankment loadings. So that's a, a little bit of a contrast to this idealized version of this setting. Um, and the stability has evidence that future rock slides could impact the dam or, or reservoir, uh, with reservoir filling that might increase that risk. So overall, in the 2008 Alberta Environment Study on Water Supply, this location received the lowest score, one out of five, in two criteria, dam safety and geotechnical. That's not even considering environmental issues, um, which include species at risk, um, fish and uh, riparian up and downstream impacts. So um, I really question how an idea that even on geotechnical grounds is as problematic as this made it on a short list that the province published as part of its mitigation framework that it wanted to really fast track a pilot study of this uh, location and dry dam um, you know, as of, as of its December 2013 mitigation framework. Some, some of our concerns um, that um, relate both to the um, cost-benefit as well as the environmental um, choice of this is that as, as this uh, reservoir is filled and backs up, um, it, it will really present erosion problems unless there's a lot more armoring and much more expensive infrastructure in place. So there's a really big cost underestimate, which, which again, for those people downstream, I think they're looking for that magic bullet. And, and what was presented in a very rudimentary form um, really would need to be a much bigger um, project to, to deliver, even, even in terms of basic stability. Um, ecologically, it would block the materials transport and uh, in terms of fish, mi fish migration, which is kind of like a uh, organic material transport that's so important to our headwater streams um, and to the whole food web that uh, relies on them. And all flood pulses that are bigger than the size of the culvert would be blocked, not just during a flood year, but all the time. So there's really major problems with those dry dams. And we, for one, really feel like we, we should not um, be looking at, at major implications in, in sensitive headwaters areas that might not even be located where the next big flood event originates um, and that would have significant ecological cost to say nothing of perhaps a false sense of security for downstream communities. The, the reason this, one of the big reasons this location was given such a low rating for dam safety was mentioned that there are Bright Creek and Calgary downstream communities in the event of a failure. Okay, switching gears now to talk about uh, uh, that huge topic of land use runoff connections. I'm just using this diagram courtesy of the Elbow River Watershed Partnership because they've done so much good work raising awareness of groundwater, surface water interaction. So it's just their diagram. Um, the opinions are mine, um, or AWAs. Um, first, uh, we, we understand that groundwater recharge is really affected by hardened surfaces, by soil compaction. That can affect our flood resiliency. Um, one thing we have a lot of questions about uh, from concerned landowners and, and uh, actually Kathy Ryan earlier this afternoon for those of you who were here said we need to understand a lot more what these effects are is how uh, gravel mining may be affecting the capacity and, and the connection between uh, gr groundwater and surface water and some really vital upwellings that are important for fish habitat and also for our base flows. Um, I, I noted here on my slide after I heard John Pomeroy talk uh, yesterday that uh, at least the way he described the Marmot Creek uh, in, uh, instrument measuring, that because of a warm period in June just before the flood rains, um, th there was some beneficial role of soil absorption and he later told me at a break that the conifer forests start transpiring as soon as the temperature gets up above, he said, 10 degrees Celsius. So that land cover and that soil cover being absorbent and functioning actually can have a role. Of course it depends on the timing, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that entirely, of course, would have soaked up this 2013 flood. It wouldn't have. But in terms of smaller runoffs and our overall flood and drought resiliency, I think these are really important things for us to carefully consider if, if, we're, if we're going to be disturbing them more and how we manage them. Uh, in terms of motorized recreation damage, um, this is a photo of Meadow, <coughs> Meadow Creek in the Ghost Watershed uh, from 2008. Um, many exposed surfaces and many 
additional points of erosion. Um, we feel, and we know many Albertans feel, that um, it, it's really time on our public lands, our headwaters, where there's such valued wildlife, and there's many kinds of recreation that we really control more the highest impact kind of recreation to be within thresholds that are, are better for our watersheds and wildlife. I'll just um, mention some uh, statistics that um, the, the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society uh, identified, or, or commissioned rather, um, the ALSIS group to, um, to uh, discuss some of the land uses in the Ghost Watershed in terms of cumulative impacts. And uh, they did some uh, ground truthing of linear disturbance and found that there's, um, uh, at any random location, so there's as good a chance as not that you'll be within 100 to 200 meters of a linear feature um, throughout the ghost watershed, and that 93% of the linear features they looked at in their samples, which they felt were representative, were currently used by off-highway vehicles, and that was a 2011 study. So it's a very extensive issue. Uh, they also said that overall, in terms of the linear feature density measurement of kilometer per kilometer squared, they estimated that it's more like five kilometers per kilometer squared, versus um, a data set that the government of Alberta was using for edge density that really just considered wider roads and what were classified as more permanent roads, but that really didn't begin to cover the extent. Um, that's contrasted with uh, our, our supposedly maximum thresholds that we're managing to, but in fact we don't seem to be managing to that for, for grizzly bear habitat. Core grizzly bear habitat should be even less, should be about half that. Um, if we could manage towards that for grizzly bear habitat, um, that would also really help our, our native fish. Um, so, and this photo that I, or this image that I've used, just shows some of the uh, cut blocks um, that are in um, uh, the rectangles you can see for, for um, Spray Lake Sawmills uh, Forest Management Agreement going from uh, north, north to south. And, and then there are the protected areas, um, free from most industrial disturbance, but you know, they have sometimes some intense uh, linear feature development as well. Okay, I want to make a connection between headwaters access and fish. Uh, because uh, fish are, our native fish are intrinsically important themselves, they've co-evolved to perfectly fit the variability of our conditions in our eastern slopes. But also, like canaries in the coal mine, their um, ability to flourish or not tells us about our land use, about our uh, state of our uh, ground uh, groundwater upwelling, the state of our uh, quality of our runoff and our sediments. So uh, this photo is of West Slope cutthroat trout that are um, really at risk in Alberta and um, a 2006 report already, that's you know almost 10 years ago now, said that there's really an explosion of access points because of um, networks associated with primary e extraction. Uh, this uh, handsome um, fish is, is our apex predator. So this is like the grizzly bear uh, in our streams, the bull trout. It's our provincial fish and they are native to uh, many watersheds, to, to uh, all, all the mountain watersheds up and down uh, the eastern slopes, whereas the West Slope cutthroat are only native to the Bowen Old Man. But um, similar to the West Slope cutthroat, they've had a, a really severe decrease in their range. They can outcompete introduced species best in the coldest waters. So they have an advantage there, but then it, that's when habitat uh, degradation starts to take over. So the number of access points, sediment, uh, runoff, and uh, um, aer aeration uh, compromises really can affect their, their numbers. In both cases, Alberta has a goal to protect and uh, to maintain and restore their populations. And so our land use choices should more closely align with that. Um, you know, in, in our view. I'm, I'm, uh, with, with the forestry example, I'm telling you the one that I know best. And that's Hidden Creek, which is not in the Bow Watershed, it's in the Upper Old Man. Hidden Creek tributary is really only a few kilometers long, um, but it's incredibly important for our threatened native fish, and you can see the stats there. Spawning site for 80% of migratory bull trout in the Upper Old Man according to an Alberta Conservation Association study of 2011. 
and, and uh, one of less than 50 genetically pure Alberta West Slope cutthroat trout populations. Now I think particularly that bull trout spawning importance was a fairly recent uh, piece of information. What Hidden Creek has that more heavily um, uh, used areas in terms of uh, logging and recreation access don't have as much anymore is sedif sediment free gravels that incubating eggs need for aeration, uh, insect habitat for the, for the juveniles, and that groundwater up upwelling, bull trout uh, spawn uh, in autumn and the eggs need to be aerated over the, over the winter and at, and at the right temperatures. So this is what Hidden Creek has, has had. Unfortunately, it was scheduled to be logged um, in November and early December of 2012. Now I want to emphasize when I finished when I finished telling this story, the logging, the forestry company, the quarter holder Spray Lake Sawmills did not do anything illegal at all. Uh, this was all government of Alberta approved. So this is more a story of how do we as citizens want our government to manage our most important uh, watersheds and an illustration of how what on the books may seem like ecosystem based considerations goes sideways um, towards a really timber supply centric view. And I think this has implications for our flood resiliency, for that native vegetation uh, absorption uh, capacity of, of, uh, of uh, forests and wetlands. So I'm relaying this to you in, in a bit of detail. Um, the, um, because of the finding of the important bull, tree, bull trout uh, spawning habitat, there ought to have been, according to the ground rules, a compartment assessment of the area, which was a really comprehensive report about how that should affect the timber uh, land base. Instead of that, which wasn't done, the, the government authorized um, the company to lay out that watershed as a Class A water body, which implies somewhat stricter uh, road setbacks. But there was no e ecological risk assessment done of that, at that small watershed level. There was no baseline monitoring done of the groundwater hydrology. Of, uh, th there had been some of the spawning sites, but of, of fish populations, of flow um, variations. So really, in a way, they didn't know enough about what had been to know what they could be destroying. And there was a great lack of transparency in terms of finding out what the plans were and why some, such an important fish uh, habitat had been authorized for logging. There's, there's little tributary buffers. Um, again, this was legally done. It's self-identification by the company about what's an intermittent versus an ephemeral um, stream. Uh, again, ALSIS in the ghost watershed um, found that some, in its view, ephemeral streams had been logged through. And they pointed to a 2008 southern, uh, Southeast BC study saying that it's some of the logging effects in these, in these very small, either ephemeral or intermittent tributaries, that really have a major effect on West Slope cutthroat trout populations. Um, this was the extent, as far as we understand, of the reclamation plan for Hidden Creek. This diagram was the plan. No text. Um, we were shown it. It's not publicly available. We were shown it because ESRD uh, gave us a meeting in January of 2013 after the, after the logging had been done. Um, you'll see a deviation that they granted. So this line is the 100 meter buffer and a, a big amount of the road that they allowed to be built, a new road, was within that 100 meter buffer that was supposed to be the Class A water body rule protecting this. So just under two kilometers of the road was less than what the rule said. And here in, in the right hand photo, you can see the silt screen that shows up in the left photo beside the road. So the silt screen, we, we just counted off and we estimated it was about 12 meters to the, there's, a, there's an embankment and then the stream right below. Um, if you contrast what was a grassed um, slope stabilized by, by uh, trees, you, you now have a, a road. And um, you also have an old seismic road, which Spray Lakes did not create, which it was allowed to use, though, for logging for part of it, um, with, with which you see the new road coming into. And there was no requirements for the company. Th there's requirements for it to reclaim the new road and to use, use extra care in doing that. But the old seismic road that was supposed to have been closed off by a Forest Service decision um, decades ago, in the, in the late 80s, was, was never properly closed. And 
now you know, remains as an access point. And the economic benefits were a few weeks of a few crews of, of logging, and I respect those jobs, but when you stack that up against the ecological values, I think we should have made a different decision. And, a, and a, only $17,000 of royalties for the province to log a stretch of kilometers of one of our best remaining in the Old Man Basin, Bull and, and West Slope Cutthroat Trout. So um, another uh, short, shorter, uh, I guess, story about logging, which is in the ghost watershed this time. Again, I think it points partly to a lack of transparency. Um, this map was hand-traced. Uh, it wasn't available electronically, but um, the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society allowed us to use this, this photo. It's my interpretation, but they had, they had hand-traced it, and, and they had mapped what to them were ecologically significant parts of this um, Atkinson Block area. And um, some of the green uh, showing up here is, is wetland areas where they learned that there were no uh, buffers allowed for those wetlands, which they have just thought were ecologically significant, um, hydrologically and for wildlife. Um, this uh, photo series shows some of the wetted areas in the lower one, and then flagging where there was logging in the upper one. So, it, again, none of this is illegal, but it's more asking the question in some of our uh, headwaters that have so important watershed and wildlife values, uh, we feel we should make, be making different decisions, and I'll summarize those uh, here. So, um, this is a busy slide, um, but uh, the first thing is we feel that we should be setting disturbance thresholds to match ecosystem goals. Now, our regional land use plan, uh, planning framework, uh, we and many other uh, citizens greeted with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, the land use framework and the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan were supposed to set uh, thresholds. They are doing some of that, and, it's, and some of it is really thanks to, to the good work of the uh, WPACs, the BRBC, the Old Man Watershed Council, and some stewardship groups. They, they have moved forward in, in terms of setting some regulatory frameworks for surface water quality. But in terms of some incredibly important land use um, management frameworks, like a biodiversity framework and a land disturbance threshold and a, and a linear uh, trails management system, we're still years and years away because they keep kicking those difficult decisions down the road for someone else to tackle. We really feel, and, and we hope many, many citizens do and can speak up about this in this next um, you know, weeks and months and years where we're going through, we need our regional plans to actually deliver on managing those cumulative uh, impacts. We, we feel that it, in, in terms of the um, ecological watershed and wildlife importance and, and recreation importance of our um, headwaters, we should aim for low impact uh, infrastructure development and, and really rethink alluvial fan uh, building. Uh, we should reclaim and restrict motorized access. I've, I've gone through that already and, and again, that's we're years away from tackling that even though we have very good data as far as where the lines are and um, you know where, where would be better areas to to uh, res restrain activity to, and, and looking at you know maybe other authorized activities you know further east or further up uh, up, up uh, lands um, rather than in, in wetted areas, um, with uh, intensive um, w with large scale uh, leases um, in, in terms of forestry or energy or even potentially grazing. I think we need to do a lot better. Uh, job of understanding uh, hydrology uh, assessments before that disturbance and making those transparent. So I, I haven't touched at all today on, on fracking. I don't have enough information about that, but I know there are very concerned landowners about how, how that, uh, both water use and um, seismic activity, is going to affect water. I think those are really important questions for the headwaters. Um, we also need, once we set rules, to do a better job of, of uh, benchmarking standards and long-term monitoring. And, and finally, in terms of um, access plans or forestry, we need transparency and we need to involve the public more meaningfully in, in uh, looking at the trade-offs and voicing concerns. 
And as, as we saw in the Hidden Creek example, there were major deviations from the rules with no requirements for offsets or, or consequences. And, and really, we, we need to make sure that more people who, who are lease or landowners are factoring those equations in. So with that, um, I uh, leave you with an image of our bull trout. Thank you very much.